Welcome back everyone to this educational channel called Learn Bio with Janet. I'm teacher Janet and today we'll be discussing the composition of human blood. So human blood consists of the liquid part called the blood plasma and there are also cells in them and fragments of cells. So the cells involved are the erythrocytes which are the red blood cells, the leukocytes or white blood cells and the platelets which are fragments of cells. Let's study their interesting adaptations that help them to carry out their functions effectively. Now, this topic is also relevant to the Form 5 students who are doing revision for Chapter 1, Form 5 syllabus on uh, transport. So, Form 5 students studying the KBSM syllabus can also use this video as a form of revision. The learning outcomes for today's video are as follows. After this lesson, you should be able to explain the composition of blood. That is, the composition of blood plasma and the functions of the various components in the blood plasma. And secondly, you should be able to explain the functions and the adaptations as well as the other characteristics of the blood cells such as erythrocytes and leukocytes. Now what is found inside a drop of blood? Okay, so if we were to take a whole test tube of fresh blood and spin it in a centrifuge, which is the machine that rotates the test tubes around, then the blood will separate out into a few layers to form a few layers. All right, there'll be three main layers. The top layer is pale yellow in color and it consists of the plasma, which is the liquid part of blood. Plasma makes up 55% of the volume of blood here. So plasma contains plasma proteins, gases, nutrients, hormones, and other things. Then there will be a thin layer. There's a thin layer below the plasma, it's white in color, and these contain the leukocytes, which are the white blood cells, and the platelets. So this makes up less than 1% of the blood volume here. The last layer is thicker and it is red in color. So this layer contains the erythrocytes or red blood cells, which makes up 45% of the blood volume. Here is a detailed flowchart to help us understand the composition of human blood. What are the components of human blood? So human blood consists of blood cells, which make up 45% of the volume of the blood, and plasma, blood plasma, which makes up 55% of the volume of blood. Now the blood cells can be divided into three types. Mm -hmm. Erythrocytes or red blood cells transport oxygen. Leukocytes or white blood cells are involved in the defense of the body against pathogens. And platelets are involved in blood clotting. Then leukocytes can be further divided into two types, granulocytes that have granules in the cytoplasm and agranulocytes that have no granules in the cytoplasm. Now granulocytes can be divided into three types, basophil, eosinophil and neutrophil. Agranulocytes can be divided into two types, lymphocytes and monocytes. So all this will be discussed later. Now the plasma is the liquid part of the blood. It consists of 90% water and 10% solutes or dissolved substances. So the dissolved substances include respiratory gases, plasma proteins, nutrients, excretory or waste substances, hormones, mineral salts and enzymes. Let's start by discussing the first component of blood, which is the blood plasma, the liquid part of blood. So blood plasma consists of water and also solutes. It's not just water. So it is 90% water and 10% solutes or dissolved substances. Now the water is very important because it is the medium of transportation to carry the solutes. To their different destinations and it is a solvent 
a very good solvent for respiratory gases, mm -hmm. ions, digestive products and excretory substances. Now what are the dissolved substances in the blood plasma? These consist of plasma proteins and other solutes. So what are plasma proteins? They are proteins that are found in the plasma and they are actually produced by organs such as the liver. So these plasma proteins have very important functions in the body. For example, fibrinogen is a plasma protein that's involved in the blood clotting mechanism, especially when a person gets a wound or a cut. Then when blood flows out or when the person is bleeding, the blood clotting mechanism will start to occur and fibrinogen plays a big role in the blood clotting process. We will be studying this later. Another plasma protein is albumin which helps to control the blood osmotic pressure. Then there is globulin which is an antibody that means a chemical substance that helps to destroy pathogens or disease causing microorganisms. So globulin is an antibody that is involved in the body's defense. Now other solutes include nutrients such as glucose and amino acids that are being transported from the small intestine to the body cells. So they are very important to the cells for energy, to provide energy and to help in the growth of the cell, especially the amino acids and vitamins that are transported are needed for the maintenance of health. Vitamins and mineral salts, okay, transported in the blood plasma are needed by the cells for maintenance of health. There are also excretory substances like urea, which are toxic substances that need to be excreted from the body. For example, urea is produced in the liver from the excess amino acids that a person uh, eats. So this urea has to be transported by the blood to the kidney to be excreted in the urine. So it's transported in the blood plasma. Now oxygen is also transported and is required for the respiration of cells. Hormones. Hormones control physiological activities in the body. So for example, uh, the physiological activities that are controlled by hormones include growth and uh, reproduction and also regulation of uh, blood sugar level and other aspects. Enzymes are also transported in the blood plasma and they are involved in the metabolic processes of the cells mm -hmm. to catalyze certain chemical reactions. Let us now discuss the three cellular components of blood. And these are the erythrocytes or red blood cells, the leukocytes or white blood cells, and the platelets. So as we discuss, we are going to compare the characteristics of the three uh, cellular components. So actually, erythrocytes and leukocytes are cells, but platelets are just fragments of cells. Let's start with the structure. The structure of the red blood cell, it has a typical biconcave disc shape. That's the structure of the red blood cell. Now, biconcave means that it is it has a, a, a sort of a part in the center that is depressed inwards on both sides due to the absence of a nucleus. There's no nucleus here. And on top of that, uh, this shape gives it a large surface area. All right. The biconcave disc shape gives the red blood cell, makes the red blood cell have a large total surface area per volume ratio. Furthermore, it is small and numerous in number. So this also causes the total surface area to volume ratio to be large. This is for the faster diffusion of oxygen through the plasma membrane into the cell. Now leukocytes, their shape is irregular and not fixed, unlike the erythrocytes. For platelets, 
their shape is also irregular because they are fragments of cell cytoplasm from large cells found in the bone marrow. So they are just the fragments or the little bits of cell cytoplasm. However, they have a very important role in blood clotting. So there are two uh, diagrams that you will find when we talk about platelets, like they have two structures. Actually, the first one here is the inactivated form of the platelet before it gets involved in the blood clotting mechanism. So in the blood, it will uh, be transported in this form, like a, a disc shape uh, that is irregular. All right, a flat, uh, roundish shape, but irregular. Uh, if the shape is not really round. Then when it is activated and the blood clotting mechanism begins, it will form tiny projections from its cell membrane. Here. Now, erythrocytes do not have a nucleus. All right, Each erythrocyte does not have a nucleus. Whereas for leukocytes, the nucleus is present and it is the shape of the nucleus is different based on the type of leukocyte. For example, granulocytes have nucleus nuclei that have a few parts or lobes. And agranulocytes may have a round nucleus or bean-shaped nucleus, depending on what cell it is. For platelets, the nucleus, there's no nucleus at all. The nucleus is not present. Color of the cell. For red blood cells, the color is red because it contains the protein pigment which is red in color and that's hemoglobin. Leukocytes are colorless. However, if they form the pus, eh, P-U-S, on a wound, you can see that it is whitish in color. So the past actually contains a lot of these white blood cells that have died huh, in the process of defending the body against pathogens at a wound. Now platelets are colorless. How about the size? The largest blood cell is the white blood cell, followed by the red blood cells or erythrocytes. And of course, the smallest uh, component here is the platelet, uh, which are just fragments of cell cytoplasm. Next, in terms of their numbers, the erythrocytes are the most numerous, most abundant in the blood, followed by the platelets. They are found in moderate amounts and leukocytes are the least in number in the blood. Now, where are these blood cells produced? So, the bone marrow, in Malay we call it sum sum tulang, and in Chinese it's called gu sui, is found in the center part of the bones. It's a red in color. If you have seen the bones that are chopped up like chicken bones, you can see that in the center there's a red tissue. All right, now that is the bone marrow. So, the bone marrow of bones, such as the sternum and ribs, produces erythrocytes and it also produces the leukocytes that is the granulocytes and the agranulocytes. Now the agranulocytes is produced in the bone marrow and also in the lymphatic system. It also develops in the lymphatic system. Platelets. Platelets are produced in the bone marrow too. So the bone marrow produces all the different types of blood cells. The red blood cells are erythrocytes, and then the white blood cells are leukocytes, and also the platelets. The lifespan. Eryth erythrocytes live for about 120 days, and after that they are destroyed in the liver and spleen through phagocytosis. Leukocytes usually live less than uh, 5 days, for example. But there are some types of leukocytes, like certain lymphocytes, that act as memory cells which remember how to produce certain antibodies. Uh, these can live on for years and they can uh, help the person to remain immune to certain diseases. 
So the topic of immunity will be discussed in the next chapter. Platelets. Platelets live less than seven days or a week. Function. What is the function of erythrocytes? An erythrocyte contains millions of the molecule called hemoglobin to transport oxygen, to bind to oxygen and to transport oxygen in the form of oxyhemoglobin from the lungs to the cells. So this is a very important function because all cells need oxygen constantly for cellular respiration. So this oxygen is transported by hemoglobin in the red blood cell. Now leukocytes defend the, defend the body against diseases. So there are two types, basically two types of leukocytes that act differently. Phagocytes engulf and destroy bacteria. They engulf and then they will digest the bacteria in order to destroy it. So their mode of action is something like amoeba. When amoeba eats, uh, eats its food. So phagocytosis will be discussed in the next chapter too. Now, another type of white blood cell are the, is the lymphocyte. So a lymphocyte produces antibodies, which are chemical substances that can destroy the pathogens or disease-causing microorganisms in different ways. Again, this will be studied in chapter 11. So leukocytes can move out through the capillary pore, especially the phagocytes huh, that can move and extend its pseudopodia and move out from the blood through the capillary pore into the intercellular spaces or into the bo body tissue fluids in order to fight the pathogens or the disease causing microorganisms in the tissue fluid. So they are quite mobile. Now, platelets are involved in an important process, blood clotting. When a person gets a cut or a wound, blood must clot in order to reduce the blood loss. And at a wound, the platelet will form a platelet plug to cover the part of the blood vessel that is injured. And if the wound is big, it will release the enzyme thrombokinase to start the blood, blood clotting process. We will discuss this in the following videos. Here's a picture of the bone marrow, which contains certain types of undifferentiated cells that can differentiate into, these are called the stem cells, huh? which can differentiate to produce the blood cells, such as the erythrocytes, all the white blood cells shown here, and the platelets. So the bone marrow is very important for the uh, synthesis of the blood cells. Here's an interesting HOTS question. There's also a Solan uh, Ramalan, a forecast question for the exam. And it is an essay question. Now explain how cell A is adapted for its function. Eight marks. So cell A here is an erythrocyte. So the first thing we have to do is to identify cell A and explain its function. Right, so it's, this is our answer. Cell A is an erythrocyte which transports oxygen from lungs to cells. Next, we have to state its adaptations for its function. So obviously, there must be more than one adaptation. All right, because this first line may give you one or two marks, may get you one or two marks. And then you need to give a few adaptations to obtain the remaining marks. Now, for adaptations, we have to state a, the particular characteristic that the, the erythrocyte has and also what the importance is of having this particular characteristic. In other words, state the characteristic and then the function that is related to that characteristic, okay, or the importance of that characteristic. For example, the first one, 
you can see that the erythro erythrocyte is small but numerous and also it has a special shape the biconcave disc shape this shape and the small size allows it to increase its total surface area to volume ratio for the faster diffusion of oxygen across the plasma membrane here into the cell so that the oxygen can bind to the hemoglobin inside the red blood cell or erythrocyte so here the first part is the characteristic small numerous and having a biconcave disc shape and then the reason why the explanation or the importance is to increase its total surface area for faster diffusion of oxygen now secondly a human erythrocyte has no nucleus so that it can contain more hemoglobin to transport more oxygen so the center part of the cell here does not have a nucleus there's no nucleus in the in the matured erythrocyte so that it has more space to contain more hemoglobin it's very important to mention the word more hemoglobin and then this is in order to to help the and this is to transport more oxygen okay so that they, there's more hemoglobin to bind with more oxygen in order to transport more oxygen to the cells thirdly an erythrocyte has an elastic plasma membrane here or flexible plasma membrane so that it can squeeze easily into the tiny blood capillaries so that it can bend huh? it's flexible so it can the structure can bend a bit and you can squeeze into the tiny blood capillaries that are almost the same size as it fourthly erythrocyte an erythrocyte contains the molecule hemoglobin which binds or combines with oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin in order to transport oxygen to the cells so an erythrocyte contains around 250 to 270 million hemoglobin molecules to bind to a lot of oxygen molecules forming the oxyhemoglobin in order to transport oxygen to the cells now we know that the red blood cells transport oxygen but how do they do it so the ability to transport oxygen lies in a molecule which they are packed with and that is the hemoglobin molecule so each red blood cell or erythrocyte contains about 250 million hemoglobin molecules just imagine that so the red blood cells really packed with a hemoglobin molecule now what is hemoglobin hemoglobin is defined as a complex protein which is a red pigment and it has the ability to transport oxygen in the blood so let's find out how it transports oxygen in the blood what is the ability how does it get the ability to transport oxygen let's look at one hemoglobin molecule uh, represented here by the yellow uh, structure all right so here we see a hemoglobin molecule and from the name itself hemoglobin we can understand that there are two parts okay we will know that there are two parts to this in this molecule there are two parts in the structure of this molecule the first part is the hem group h a e m or h e m e group huh? so the textbook uses this spelling h e m e the hem group so each hemoglobin molecule has four of these hem groups which are actually the uh, ring-like organic compounds uh, a hem group is a ring-like organic compound which contains an ion atom in the center all right and the other part of the hemoglobin molecule is the globin all right so it the hemoglobin molecule has four polypeptide chains that forms the globin uh, group or the globular uh, protein uh, called globin so here are the polypeptide chains the purple one green one red one and pink one so the four polypeptide chains forms the globin 
uh, structure or molecule. In fact, each polypeptide chain is sometimes also called uh, globin polypeptide, uh, alpha and beta globin polypeptide. But we do not have to go into that. So, the each polypeptide chain has a ham group attached to it. All right, there are four polypeptide chains. Each polypeptide chain has a ham group attached to it. And in each ham group, there is an iron atom denoted by the red structure here. And each iron atom in the ham group can bind to one oxygen molecule, O2, like this. All right, these are the oxygen molecules, O2. So each iron atom can bind to one oxygen molecule, O2. So the iron is the binding site uh, of the hemoglobin molecule with oxygen. All right, And that's how it transports oxygen to the cells. So one hemoglobin molecule can transport four oxygen molecules, O2, in its uh, molecule. Just imagine if the erythrocyte has 250 million hemoglobin molecules, how many oxygen molecules can it transport? You have to multiply by 4. Huh? So to recap, in the blood, we have the red blood cells. In the red blood cells, we have many, many hemoglobin molecules. In each hemoglobin molecule, we have 4 polypeptide chains and 4 hem groups. The hem groups are attached to the polypeptide chain. Each polypeptide chain has one hem group attached to it. Then in the hem group, there is an iron atom. In each hem group, there's an iron atom which can bind to one oxygen molecule. Okay, that is the structure of the hemoglobin molecule. Let us discuss how oxygen is transported from the lungs to the body cells. So let's consider two places or two parts of the body, the lungs and then the body tissues or the cells. Now in the lungs, when the partial pressure of oxygen is high, and that is in the lungs, huh, hemoglobin combines with oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin. So these are the alveoli in the lungs and they contain a high concentration of oxygen or we say that the partial pressure or concentration of oxygen is high in the lungs. Thus, the oxygen will diffuse from the alveoli into the blood. This blood that flows into here is deoxygenated blood with less oxygen or without any oxygen. So the oxygen diffuses from the alveoli into the blood and into the red blood cells like this. And it combines with hemoglobin because the process occurs when the partial pressure or concentration of oxygen is high. Then hemoglobin will combine with oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin. So this is the erythrocyte with the many hemoglobin molecules and we see the, the oxygen molecule combining with the iron atom in each hemoglobin molecule. So in the end, we get oxyhemoglobin. When oxygen combines with hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin is produced. And this is a bright red compound. Next, the blood will then be oxygenated. Huh? Then it will flow to the body tissues. So in the body tissues, when the partial pressure of oxygen is low, okay, in body tissues, oxyhemoglobin dissociates or breaks down and separates from, and the oxygen component will separate from the hemoglobin, and so the oxygen is then released to the cells. So tissues use up, the cells use up a lot of oxygen in cellular respiration, so the concentration the concentration of oxygen in the cells is low. Then, in this condition, oxyhemoglobin will dissociate and release the oxygen. So the compound will become 
will revert back to the hemoglobin stage, right? When it's just hemoglobin and when there are no more oxygen molecules that are bound to it. So here we see the red blood cells are huh, releasing the oxygen when the, the when oxyhemoglobin has dissociated and the oxygen is released to the body fluids here to the tissue fluid and then it diffuses into the cells now here are the notes concerning the structure and function of hemoglobin which we have discussed in the previous slides so i'll pick out certain points here huh? Now the structure, a hemoglobin molecule contains the protein called globin, which has four polypeptide chains, and each polypeptide chain is attached to a hem group. So hemoglobin has four hem groups. A hem group consists of a ring-like compound with an ion atom, which is the binding site for oxygen. So each ion atom can bind to one oxygen molecule, O2. Function of hemoglobin has already been discussed in the previous slide. So do go through these notes and copy it down if you need to. Now, fun fact, your body makes about 2 million red blood cells every second. So that is a fantastic thing that the body can do. We have already discussed blood plasma, erythrocytes and platelets. Let us now discuss the leukocytes in more detail. Now, we know that there's one type of erythrocyte. Erythrocytes are made of only one type of cell. But for leukocytes, there are a few types of leukocytes. So we can categorize leukocytes into two categories. One are the granulocytes and the other are the agranulocytes. So granulocytes are the leukocytes that have granules in the cytoplasm, meaning small particles that will be stained by a stain. And they also have a lobed nucleus, meaning a nucleus that has a few rounded parts like this. For example, this cell has two lobes in the nucleus, and this cell has four lobes in the nucleus. So, granulocytes have lobed nucleus and granules in the cytoplasm. Now, from this word granulocytes, we can see that the cell is a cell that has granules, right? Granule in the cell. Sites means cell. On the other hand, we also have the agranulocytes. So, the word er here, A or er here means not. Okay, so agranulocytes are the leukocytes that do not have any granules in their cytoplasm. Furthermore, they have a round or bean-shaped nucleus, as is seen from these two cells. No granules in the cytoplasm, and this cell called a lymphocyte has a round nucleus, whereas the monocyte has a bean-shaped nucleus. So granulocytes can be divided into three types basophil, eosinophil, and neutrophil. Whereas agranulocytes can be divided into two types, lymphocytes and monocytes. Right, let's go on to the granulocytes, the basophil. Basophils secrete heparin, which is an anticoagulant to prevent blood clotting in the body. For eosinophils, they secrete enzymes that help to control inflammation, which is a body defense mechanism, and allergic reactions. So inflammation is a condition where the body becomes red, swollen, hot and painful, for example, as a reaction or response to an injury or a wound that is that occurs. Now neutrophils, they carry out phagocytosis by engulfing and digesting bacteria and other foreign particles. Lymphocytes and monocytes belong to the category called agranulocytes. So lymphocytes produce antibodies to destroy pathogens. Antibodies are chemical substances produced by the lymphocytes. 
that can destroy pathogens and also foreign bodies, other foreign bodies. Monocytes carry out phagocytosis. So let's go into detail about all these functions. Here's an easy acronym to help you remember the five different types of leukocytes, namely the basophils, eosinophils, and neutrophils, and then the lymphocytes and monocytes. Think of the words bands limo. B for basophil, E for eosinophil, N for neutrophil. Then L for lymphocyte, MO for monocyte. So the first three, basophil, eosinophil, and neutrophils are granulocytes. And the last two here, lymphocytes and monocytes, are agranulocyte. Right? The word limo is the short form of limousine, which is a luxury vehicle, usually chauffeur-driven, and it looks like a very big car. So here are the notes, more detailed notes on the white blood cells. Now the functions given are based on those that are uh, discussed in the textbook. Let's have a look. So neutrophils make up about 40 to 60% of all the white blood cells in the body. They are the most abundant white blood cells, right? Sometimes there may be up to 70 or 70 plus percent neutrophils. Now, a neutrophil has three, four, or five lobes in the nucleus. For example, this nucleus has four lobes. The function is to ingest bacterial cells and dead cells in the wounds through phagocytosis. So when a person gets a cut or a wound, the pathogens or disease-causing microorganisms will try to enter the body through the wounds. So the job or function of the neutrophil is to destroy these pathogens before they enter. Okay, for example, they will try to destroy these pathogens and by using a process called phagocytosis, where they will ingest, meaning they will engulf the bacterial cells, they will surround the bacterial cells with their pseudopodia and try to engulf it, and then they will produce enzymes to digest the bacterial cells and other pathogens. So eosinophil is the second type of leukocyte. It has two lobes in the nucleus. Now the name eosinophil comes from the stain, eosin, a red stain, because uh, the eosinophil will be stained red. All right, the granules will be stained red by the red stain. So it has two lobes in the nucleus and it releases enzymes that control inflammation and allergic reactions. This is the function. So, inflammation, as we know, is the process whereby the part of the body that is injured, for example, will become red, swollen, painful, and painful. All right. So, eosinophil is involved in this response. This is a defense mechanism. All right. And then, uh, allergic reactions. Uh, an allergic reaction is a very sensitive immune response or reaction to pollen, fur, uh, peanut, or other substances that the person may be sensitive to. Maybe that may be the person may be very sensitive to, and it may cause itching of the skin, swelling, uh, runny nose, and sneezing, and other allergic responses. So all this is uh, all these responses involve the eosinophil. Basophil is the least common okay, type of white blood cell. So it has two to three lobes in the nucleus, and its function is that it contains heparin, an anticoagulant, to prevent the blood from clotting in the body. Now, lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are the second most abundant white blood cell after neutrophils. Okay, they are, it makes up about 20 to 40 percent of all the white blood cells in the body. So it has a round nucleus, uh, the only white blood cell with the round or spherical nucleus with very little cytoplasm, right, at the sides. The function of lymphocyte is very uh, unique in that it's the only cell that can produce the antibodies to destroy bacteria and viruses that enter the body. So there are different types of lymphocytes, all right. So uh, lymphocytes produce antibodies which are chemical substances 
made of protein that are able to destroy pathogens such as bacteria and viruses that enter the body. And it produces a type of antibody called antitoxin that can neutralize bacterial toxins. Monocytes are the biggest of all the white blood cells. A monocyte has a bean-shaped nucleus like this or a kidney-shaped nucleus. Now some books write that it has a spherical nucleus. So that's, that could be a mistake huh? because the spherical nucleus is found in the lymphocyte. Okay, whereas the monocyte has a bean-shaped nucleus, as you can see here. It is the biggest leukocyte and it ingests bacteria and dead cells by phagocytosis, just like the neutrophil. So phagocytosis is the process whereby the white blood cell or even the amoeba extend the pseudopodia to engulf uh, the bacteria, for example. Huh? For white blood cells, they extend the pseudopodia, engulf the bacteria, and then they produce, release enzymes to digest the bacteria or the pathogens. This picture shows a human blood smear. So a human blood smear is a thin layer of blood that is spread out on a slide and then treated with stains to color the cytoplasm and the nucleus so that they can be easily seen under the microscope. So if we look under the microscope uh, and we observe the human blood smear, we can see that the blood is made up of three cellular components, the erythrocytes, leukocytes and the platelets. For example, this is an erythrocyte and the center part may look a bit uh, white in color because it is uh, it doesn't have a nucleus first of all and secondly the center part is usually biconcave huh? so it forms a thin layer here and when the light shines from underneath it looks a bit transparent huh? so this is an erythrocyte and then further down here we see structures like specks of dust but it's not dust huh? it's actually the platelets right platelets that are involved in blood clotting. Now, how about the leukocytes or white blood cells? So this picture shows you the five types of leukocytes. First one is a neutrophil. It has uh, a nucleus with three lobes or four lobes or five lobes. And it is a granulocyte. So we can see the granules inside the cytoplasm. How about this one? What type of white blood cell is this? It's an eosinophil uh, and it has a nucleus that has two lobes. This one is a basophil, all right? It's also a granulocyte and has granules in the cytoplasm. Now, how about this cell with a bean-shaped nucleus? This is a monocyte. And lastly, this cell here is a round spherical nucleus huh, is a lymphocyte. Here are some interesting hot questions that may be asked in the exam. They can be in, in the form of a structured question or an essay question. Number one, explain why a person needs to lie down for a while after donating blood. Two marks. Number two, what types of food should a blood donor eat after blood donation? To aid the recovery of his body, three marks. Compare and contrast the structures and functions of the two cells, A and B, shown here, shown below here, cell A and cell B. So to compare and contrast the structures and functions, you have to state some similarities and some differences. Number four, amphibians and fishes have red blood cells that contain nuclei as shown in the diagram here. So unlike the red blood cells of mammals and of humans, Many other vertebrates have red blood cells that contain nuclei. So what are two advantages and two disadvantages of having red blood cells that have nuclei? Or we call them nucleated red blood cells. Okay, this is the, these are the nuclei inside the red blood cells. 
So the shape of the red blood cell is uh, not biconcave. Huh? Instead, it is oval shaped like this. So do try these questions and after that, have a look at the answers in the description box below this video. That's all for this video. In the next video, we'll be discussing the human blood vessels such as arteries, veins and capillaries. And if possible, we'll also include the mechanism of heartbeat. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for the next video. Do share, like and subscribe. Goodbye for now.